this weekend to South Carolina. They finished very well. We're so proud of our quizzers. God bless them. Amen. All right. Why don't we stand to our feet? We want to go under the word of the Lord. I am looking at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. We're not going to park here, but uh, it's a good launching place. Not going to get into the theology behind all of it. Probably leave you with some questions, but here's what you need to know. The Bible says, for he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world that we may be holy and unblemished in his sight in love. I, um, I've been on a quest here lately, and I've got a couple of different directions that I'm going in my studies. But um, I really believe that uh, this year, uh, God wants us to increase our awareness, our understanding, even revelation of uh, the importance and value and the special place for the church and what that means to us as individuals and corporately. And so a couple of Wednesday nights ago, I reached way back into the Old Testament and I saw Isaac and Rebekah as a type and a shadow 
of uh, the church and Christ in the New Testament. We're not going to go back through that this morning. Uh, I would say it would be great to go back on our YouTube channel, pick up that one session two Wednesdays ago concerning the coming of a bride, and we talk about Isaac and Rebecca. Some beautiful typology there. Well, that got me going on the business of maybe the need to slow down a little bit and work up a series, short series. And so uh, I am calling that series, Here Comes the Bride. And today, I want to talk about another couple in the Old Testament who were types and shadows of the coming church, that being Jacob and Rachel. Um, Let's bow our heads and let's pray and let's ask the Lord to help us. God, right now, we want our understanding illuminated here this morning. God, we want to deepen our depth of understanding and revelation of what you want to show us. Pray, God, that you would help us, Lord, to tune in and help us, O Lord, to shut out all the distraction. Help us to put our thinking cap on. Help us, Lord, to consider the revelatory insights that you want to continue to share with us, the church. And I pray, God, that you would bless us today and help us to receive it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. For God chose us in Christ when? Come about us, the church, before the very foundation of the world. In other words, God had all this settled. God had all this planned out long before the church was ever birthed at Pentecost 2,000 years ago. And he wants us and has challenged us and has predestined us to be holy and without blemish in his sight. That right there is a Bible study. When you go to the book of Ephesians, which is one of the fav- my favorite New Testament books, evidently the church was part of God's eternal purpose even before the beginning of the creation of the world. It goes that far back. Somebody needs to hear it. The church is not an afterthought. On the part of God. The church is not God's second solution to a long time problem. The church is not something that God invented to fix something that broke 6,000 years ago. Before Adam and Eve were ever in the garden. Before there ever was a tree of knowledge of good and evil. Before sin ever entered into the world, God already had a plan for a church. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8 through 12. Watch this. The Bible says, I am less than the least of all God's people, yet God gave me this privilege of talking to the Gentiles, the good news about the infinite riches of Christ and of making all people see how God's secret plan is to be put into effect. Watch this. God, who is the creator of all things, kept his secret hidden through all past ages. Secret. What secret? I love secrets. Tell me your secret. In order that at the present time, by means of the church, everybody said the church, Church. the angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom in all of its different forms. God did this according to his eternal purpose, which he achieved through Christ Jesus our Lord. Again, there's depth to that. And you can explore that in a dozen different ways. 
and it, and it takes you to several different important points. What I want you to see out of that this morning is that long before man ever came along, God had a secret plan. And that plan was the building up of a church. And then the secret was that this church would be made up of both Jews and Gentiles in the end time. What you need to know is that this secret that I'm talking about right now was never revealed in the Old Testament. Nobody saw the church coming. Nobody understood that God is going to call out a covenant people of both Jew and Gentile and enter into relationship with them and build what we call the church. They didn't see it. They didn't get it. Old Testament prophets didn't see it. Those who studied the law, the Mosaic Covenant, didn't see it. Even Satan didn't see it. Now you stick with me. Satan well understood from the Old Testament scriptures that Christ would come. Think in terms of like Isaiah 53. Satan knew that Christ was coming. He also knew uh, where he would come. Bethlehem. Satan knew how he would come. Satan even knew why he would come as far as redemption for mankind was concerned. But Satan didn't have a clue. Nowhere in the Old Testament prophecies of which Satan was an expert in understanding the Word of God. If anybody studied the Bible, it was Satan. He never saw it coming. He did not see this mystery in the King James or this secret of Jews and Gentiles being bound together in one body we call the church. Satan didn't see it coming. Seated with Christ in heavenly places, the church gaining authority over all of Satan's work. He didn't see it coming. And neither did anybody else. Yet, all through the Old Testament, God kept saying, I've got a secret. I wish I could tell somebody the angels didn't hear it. The angels didn't know it. It was like, well, I'd sure love to tell somebody what I got cooking. I got something in the oven that's going to be ready after a while. I wish I could tell everybody. But God didn't because it was a, shh, a secret. So what did God do? God said, okay, I can't tell you, but I can hint. You ever had anybody try to say, hey, I got a secret. I can't tell you what it is, but you want a hint? And this is where God was at. All through the Old Testament, God gave us subtle hints through types and shadows. That's what we call it. Repeatedly, the Old Testament taught a future relationship with the Messiah and a bride later to be called the church. Now, to give you an example here, all through the Old Testament, there are these repeated types and shadows. One that I'm kind of focused on right now that I saw not long ago. Anytime you see a well and a woman and a man pouring water out of the well or from the well, I tell you what you got, you have an Old Testament type and shadow of Christ and the church coming in the New Testament. We talked about it two weeks ago with Isaac and Rebecca. Today, we are talking about Jacob and Rachel again. A man comes to a well. Here comes a lovely lady. There's water that's poured out. And there are life lessons for us to learn. Now, these are not the only two. There's also Zipporah, 
who was the Gentile bride of Moses. We can talk about her. There was the woman at the well of Samaria in Jesus' day, a type and a shadow of the coming church. So you can go all over your Bible and start seeing this stuff. So what we want to do today is we want to zoom in on Jacob and Rachel. I don't know how well you know the story. We do know that Jacob had traveled 500 miles from Canaan where Isaac, his father, was. And he traveled to a place called Haran where his mama came from. And he made that trek because he was running from his brother Esau. He had gotten Esau's birthright and blessing that naturally belonged to Esau, the firstborn, but Jacob ended up with it. And so now Jacob is running for his life. Another side issue for Jacob was that he was looking for a wife. But he wasn't looking for a wife among the Canaanites. He was looking for a wife amongst his own relatives that were back in Haran where he traveled. And so here is Jacob. He arrives at the same well. This is in Genesis 29. He arrives at the same well his mama had drawn water out of years before where she was eventually found by Eliezer, the servant of Abraham, and she made that 500-mile trek to go marry a guy she had never met before by the name of Isaac, who's Jacob's daddy. We know that he gets there, the Bible says, that there are sheep there. There are three Groups of sheep, three flocks of sheep. There are at least three shepherds that are there. And it's while he's in discussion with them, out in the distance, he saw this young filly on her way in with her flocks to water her sheep. And basically when Jacob laid his eyes on this woman. Something leaped in his heart. This woman's face and this woman's figure turned him every way but right side up. (laughs) Evidently, this woman was stunning. She was what some people would say today, drop dead gorgeous. And evidently she was. Her name was Rachel. And so the Bible says that Jacob in his exchange with these shepherds, he asked them, hey, does a fella named Laban live anywhere around here? And they said, oh yeah, he, he, he lives right there in Haran. In fact, that's his daughter coming right now. And so now he knows who she is. Watch this. The Bible says, and I'm just kind of walking through the narrative here. Jacob jumps up. He ran over to the well that daily was covered by this massive rock that evidently it took several of them to move. And the Bible says that he ran up to this rock and single-handedly he manhandled this rock from off the covering of the well. And then the Bible says he started watering Rachel's sheep. And after he had watered the sheep, you go read it, Genesis 29. The Bible says he came over to Rachel I'm sure he can probably barely speak. She's so beautiful. He introduced himself to Rachel as her relative. Your daddy and my mama are brother and sister. And of course, the Bible then says that he he kissed her. He kissed her. And then he lifted up his head and worshiped the Lord with tears flowing down his cheek. 
Rachel, the Bible doesn't say she said anything to him. I imagine she was taken aback. Instantly, the Bible says, immediately she turned and then she ran. She ran back to Haran, went straight to her daddy and explained to her daddy, hey, there's, there's, there's a guy out here at the well and he says that, that uh, he is your nephew and, 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 and he says that, that, that he is here on assignment from God and, 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 and he moved the stone all by himself and he's watered my sheep and, and then he kissed me and, and I don't know what to do about it. Well... Go read. The Bible says that Laban jumped up, went to the well, joyously greeted Jacob, his nephew, invited him into the home. That evening, Jacob spent the evening laying it all out for him as to the birthright and the blessing and where he stands in covenant relationship with God. And, of course, Laban invites Jacob to stay as long as you like. Well, that works well for a while until one day Laban suggested, you, you know, you know, you're going to be here a while and you're working for me. Why not get paid while you're here? Why don't you become my employee? Laban said, the only thing I need to know, Jacob, is what do you want for wages? Hmm. <laughs> Jacob said, I'm so glad you asked that question. <laughs> he said, what I want, I want that. Younger daughter of yours, Rachel. She's beautiful. She's gorgeous. And I can't see going through life without her by my side. In fact, I love her so much, I will work seven years as your employer without any other pay if you will just give me Rachel her hand in marriage as a dowry. I will work seven long years years. Okay? They agreed. And thus began this wonderful relationship between Jacob and Rachel. When you read on, you find that Rachel and Jacob had children. They had two sons, one by the name of Joseph. Remember Joseph in Egypt? And then there was another uh, younger boy. He was the youngest of the 12 tribes or the 12 sons of Jacob, a uh, fellow by the name of Benjamin. In fact, when you keep reading, you find out that Joseph's two sons and Benjamin became leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel. Three of the 12 tribes were those two boys of Joseph and Benjamin. And then, of course, the rest is history. So here we've got this story. It's a nice story. You know, it's a good story. You know, everybody loves a good love story. But you see, God had a secret. And that secret was, I can't tell you, but I'd like to tell you. And so by way of types and shadows, we have Jacob here as a type of Christ and Rachel as a type of the church. Now, we're not going to talk about Jacob so much. There's this beautiful comparison between the life of Jacob and the life of Jesus Christ that is well worth your exploration. We want to focus on Rachel here and her being a type and a shadow of the New Testament church. Now, watch this. Uh, Genesis chapter 29 uh, the Bible tells us in the New Living Translation, Jacob hurried on, finally arriving in the land of the east. He saw a well in the distance. That's the well we've been talking about. Three flocks of sheep and goats lay in an open field beside it. Watch this. They are waiting to be watered. But a heavy stone covered the mouth of the well. It was the custom there to wait for all the flocks to arrive before removing the stone and watering the animals. Afterward, the stone would be placed back over the mouth of the well. You say, well, that's a nice story. That sounds good. But what does that have to do with tea in China? What has that got to do with a New Testament church? You know, there's some beauty here that we need to explore here. There were three flocks 
of sheep and goats that were there along with their shepherds who were evidently waiting for all the other groups to arrive so that they together would have the physical strength to move the stone that covered the mouth of the well. And when Rachel arrives, Jacob goes ballistic. Jacob wants so much to impress this young maiden, Rachel, that he jumped up and he moved that stone all by himself, right? And then he watered all of Rachel's sheep. Can I say it? Some things never change. When Jacob saw Rachel, he single-handedly manhandles the stone from the well's mouth and, and, and then waters all of her sheep. Question, what does the typical boy first want to do when he's impressing a girl that he likes? Right? Am I telling the truth? He wants to show her how strong he is. You want to see my biceps? Hey, you think I can move this stone? I can move it. Let me show you. Now, Jacob, move that stone. If Jacob ever got a hernia moving that stone, Rachel would have been the last person in the world to ever know. (laughs) Rachel's natural beauty stunned Jacob. Right then and there he decided, I got to have this woman. This girl has to be my wife. Whatever it takes, however much it costs, I feel the Holy Ghost already. Whatever it takes, however much it costs, I cannot see myself going through life without her as my eternal companion. Is that starting to sound a little familiar? He tried to get three shepherds to hurry up and water their flocks, evidently, so that Jacob could have Rachel all to himself. I never saw that till this weekend. I was reading in a different version than the King James. And I began to understand that the chronological order, he he actually asked the boys, the shepherds that were there, Hey, you guys, uh, I know you're just sitting around waiting for everybody else to get here. And he said, why don't you go ahead and move the stone, water your sheep so that you can graze them a while before you put them up for the night. In other words, let me help you get out of here because I see this gal coming down the road. I want to spend some personal time with her. Let me read it to you. You're acting like you don't believe it. 29, verse 7 and 8, the Bible says, Jacob said, hey, he's talking to the shepherds. There's a lot of daylight left here, boys. It isn't time to round up the sheep yet, isn't it? So why not water the flocks and then just go back to grazing? And they said, we can't. Not until all the shepherds get here. It takes us all to move the stone from the well. Not until then can we water the flocks. Now, I said all that to say this. Like Jacob and how he felt toward Rachel. Have you ever considered just how deeply enamored Jesus Christ is with his church? This is revelatory for somebody. We're going to be his bride, his beloved, his betrothed. Have you ever considered just how much Jesus loves the church? Jesus saw us like Jacob. Jesus loved us like Jacob. 
And he enacted this plan to purchase us by way of not a seven-year stint as an employee, but he went far beyond by offering himself as a sacrifice for us. You starting to get the picture? Maybe, maybe, just maybe, the light is dawning and you're, you're just now beginning to understand just how and why Jesus is so good to us, the church. Are you beginning to understand now why? These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. If they uh, drink any deadly thing, it shall not harm them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Are you beginning to understand just how much the Lord wants to impress us as his bride? Every sign, every miracle, every supernatural act, every gift that comes amongst us, we need to start seeing this thing a little different. We need to start recognizing it's the Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. God wants to bless us. God wants to empower us. God wants to grant to us His many varied gifts. Why? Because he loves us. We say we understand that. I don't think we do at times. There never was any doubt on the part of Christ as to his commitment to the church. No matter what the cost, no matter the suffering, no matter how long it took, Christ chose the church to become his bride. And there is nothing that can change that inevitability. Jesus has decided on his bride. Now, when Jacob first saw Rachel, he announced that he was her daddy's nephew, that his mama was her daddy's sister, And then the Bible says, he kissed her just out there in the open in front of God and everybody without asking, without permission. Ooh, there are some people today that would say, you know what, only 29 chapters into the 66 books of the Bible, we already have the world's first case of sexual harassment. The Bible says that Jacob worked as a servant or an employee for seven long years to win her hand in marriage, basically to pay her dowry. The Bible tells us that those seven years to Jacob were like just a few days. Because of his love for her. Christ's love for us, the church, becomes all that much more intense the longer we serve him and the more we stay covenanted with him. Now, there's several different ways to look at this, but one way that I'd never really considered before. You know, the church has been here for a while, right? We're 2,000 years old, right? I would say we're wearing our age pretty well, wouldn't you? (laughs) Tell you what I see in the scripture, as far as Jesus Christ, our betrothed, is concerned, 
we've never looked better. We've never looked more stunning and beautiful as we look today. I think the more the Holy Ghost works on us as to individually conforming us into the image of Jesus Christ, the more beautiful and attractive and desirable we become to him. In other words, we're 2,000 years old. For Christ, as far as he's concerned, beauty is a whole lot deeper than skin deep, right? I'm glad for that, aren't you? I also know, according to the scripture here, that the longer we walk with God and the more in our faith we mature, evidently the more beautiful we become to God. How do I know that? <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 5. <clears throat> the Bible says, verse 25 through 27. Husbands, Paul's given instructions to husbands and wives. Love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word that he might present to himself a glorious church, <clears throat> not having <clears throat> spot <clears throat> or wrinkle. Everybody said wrinkle. wrinkle. Or any such thing that it should be holy. Talking about the church. Should be holy and without blemish. I went and looked up that word in the Greek for wrinkle. Oh, nobody likes that word. <laughs> nobody likes wrinkles. Well, it's coming today. We won't have any wrinkles. That word wrinkle is rudus. In the Greek, you know what it means? Wrinkles. <laughs> Folds in the face. Folding of the skin, right? That's what it means. Evidently. The more the church is perfected in the eyes of God, the younger and the more beautiful and the more valuable that we become to Jesus Christ, our beloved. I don't know if that means anything to you. That means a whole lot to me. You know, one thing it does mean, uh, you don't need your facials. You don't need your anti-aging cream. You don't need your elective sur surgeries to impress your suitor, Jesus Christ. You want to know why? Because as far as he's concerned, the longer he waits, the prettier you get. Oh, come on, somebody here. Help me out this morning. That means something to me. That means the longer I serve him, the more valuable I become to him. The more beautiful I am in his sight. The younger I am seen by Christ, the longer I live. Just as Jacob worked a total of 14 long years for Rachel in marriage... So Christ gave so much more of himself to win the right to marry the church. You see, for Jacob, it was days and dollars, it was years of service, it was wages. But see, when it comes to Jesus Christ, it can't be measured. In days and dollars, it had to be measured in sweat and blood. And that's what happened at Calvary. Because Jesus Christ loved the church so much that he gave himself for us. He went to Calvary as a, as, not as an uninvited guest, but as a willing participant. He paid our price. He died our death. He shed his blood for the likes of you and I. Say what you will. 
I believe the longer we serve the Lord, the more valuable and beautiful we become to Jesus Christ. The younger we look, as far as he's concerned. See, it all goes back to beauties in the eye of the beholder, right? When you talk about Satan, you know what he thinks of us? You're trash. But beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Jesus looks at us. He doesn't see trash, but he sees treasure. Well, come on now. I need a little help here this morning. Am I in the book or not? See, Peter's on the housetop, Joppa, waiting for the meal. And God has a Gentile family that he wants to see saved and incorporated into the then Jewish church. So he gives Peter this vision, all these unclean beasts and the sheep. He lowers that sheep down and a voice from heaven says, Arise, Peter, slay and eat. Peter said, not me. I've never touched, much less eaten any of that stuff. And the Lord spoke, and it's revelatory. He said, what God has cleansed, don't you be calling unclean. What I call beautiful, don't you be calling ugly. In other words, don't be talking about my beloved. I believe that's the way the Lord sees us. The world sees ashes. The Lord sees beauty. You know, there are people out there. They really think there's something. They think they've got enough money, right, enough connections, enough political power. You read stories here, there, and yonder being stopped by the authorities, maybe a traffic citation. Officers writing out the ticket. That proud, arrogant person says, I guess you don't know who I am. (laughs) No, really, I don't. (laughs) But what's even more important is when it's the church in mind here, the answer is, no, you don't know whose I am. That's what you don't know. You don't know who I belong to. You don't know who's called me out of the world. You don't know who has singularly picked me out. I got picked for the team. I got called out of the crowd. I've been brought into a body of believers. I'm a part of the church. You must not know whose I am. Because if you did, you wouldn't be treating me the way you're treating me. You know, I'm wrapping up here. You know, some might say, well, yeah, all that's good, Pastor. That sounds good. Makes a good chart. There's some typology there, I admit. But what about when you go further? I never said that we have to chase a type and a shadow all the way from the beginning to end. And you'll find that over and over in the scriptures. God only goes so far with chasing a type and a shadow, and then you stop where the scriptures stop. Some people might say, well, you know, all that sounds good and proper. But uh, the last time I thought, preacher, I thought that Jacob ended up being saddled with Rachel's sister. Unintentionally. Even before he got the girl that he wanted. That's true. That's a story for another day. (laughs) But it will give you something to think about. For you theologians out there, consider the idea of Leah representing Old Testament Israel and Rachel representing the New Testament 
church. Think about it. So, let's stand to our feet. Here's Jacob. He alone moves this stone from the well's mouth out of the way and watered Rachel's sheep, right? I'm sure the Bible doesn't say. Rachel's got to be on the sidelines. And you would, you'd pay $100 for that look on her face. When Jacob latched hold of that stone that every day of her life it took several men to move it. And Jacob all by himself moved that stone. Can you imagine the look on her face? She would have had to have been impressed. Oh, he's so strong. (laughs) That this relative of mine has alone moved the stone just as the church of the living God is in awe and wonder at the moving of a stone that no man could move. What are you talking about, preacher? I'm talking about it was Jesus's resurrection that alone moved that stone that covered his tomb. Just like the stone in Haran separated the sheep from the cool water below so also did that cursed stone at the tomb of Christ keep mankind and his church away from the fountain of living water of God's infilling spirit. And so when that stone was moved away, The tomb of Jesus Christ, what happened? That well of living water began to pour out and to quench the thirst of his church 50 days later at Pentecost, the day of the outpouring of the Spirit of God. See, there's typology. Jacob loved Rachel so much that seven years of toiling in the broiling summer sun and, of course, shaking under the freezing desert nights for seven long years, the Bible says, it only felt like a few days to Jacob. I'll read it to you. Genesis 29, 20. So Jacob worked for Laban seven years so that he could marry Rachel. But they seemed like just a few days to him because he loved Rachel so much. Just as Jacob longed for Rachel to be his wife, so Jesus Christ longs for the companionship of his bride we call the church. It's in services just like today. The Lord shows up amongst us so that he can spend some time with us to talk to us, to share with us, to see us. Because he's enamored with us. church wasn't born yesterday neither were we betrothed to Christ as a future bride a few weeks ago we've been around the church for 2,000 years and you need to know 2,000 years means nothing to Jesus Christ 
when he considers the outcome. In other words, after 2,000 years, Jesus still has not changed his mind about us. He loves us just as much today or more than when the church was birthed at Pentecost. As far as the Lord, our bridegroom to be, is concerned, you need to hear me, we are as beautiful or more so to Him than we've ever been at any time in the past. The bottom line is, Jesus, our groom in waiting, wants us in heaven with Him more than we want to be in heaven with Him. I close with this. I was a young man when I first came to the Lord. It didn't take books of higher education for me to understand a good deal when I saw a good deal. And I don't know how you feel about it today, but if you're a part of the bride of Christ, if you're a part of the church, there's not enough money in the world that could make me say no to my potential suitor. Jesus Christ. There's not enough money in the world. The reason I said no to the world and yes to my bridegroom, I'll tell you why. Well, start adding it up. Unfathomable riches, a heavenly home, eternal life, and a marriage made in heaven. Now that's a deal that you can't refuse. I know what I said. I said, yeah, 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 yeah. Take me with you. Let's go now. The question for every person in this building is, what did you say when the Lord proposed to you? Did you turn him down? Did you tell him to wait a while? Did you tell him I'll think about it? There are people in this building that struggle in their self-identity. You wrestle, beating yourself up over all your coulda, shouldas, and wouldas never measuring up, never being good enough, never making the grade, listening to the wrong voices, the enemy telling you you don't have what it takes, God doesn't love you, you don't count. God wrote you off his list. You know what the truth is? We're all a mess. Nobody here claims to be perfect. We are all broken human beings. All of us have bad hair days. All of us struggle with flesh and carnality. We make plenty of mistakes. But I don't know about you, but I decided a long time ago, I know which side my bread is buttered on. I know what's awaiting me as a part of the bride of Christ. I'm not going anywhere. I tell you what you need to do, ma'am. I tell you what you need to do, sir. You need to hang on to the church like a bulldog hangs on to a bone. I'm not getting up. I'm not giving up. I'm not walking out. You can't run me off. You can't pry me out of these chairs. I'm here to stay. Let's close our eyes all over the building. Come on, let's talk to the Lord right now. God, right now, in the name of Jesus. 
God, you see us. You understand us. Lord, we are nothing but dirt. Lord, you see everything there is to see in us. God, we don't see beauty. God, we don't see brains. God, we don't see broad when we look in the mirror. God, what we see is a mess. What we see is a lot of trouble. What we see is a lot of ups and downs and ins and outs and backs and forth. That's what we see. You're just the person I'm talking to this morning. Get off. Get off that argument. Walk away from the pity party. Lift your chin, stick out your chest, and recognize, yes, I'm a mess. Yes, I'm a problem. Yes, I'm a lot of trouble. But you don't understand. He loves me. He loves me. And that's not going to change. Somebody needs to hear what I'm asking right now, I'm asking quickly to get up, come down around the front. We're going to pray together right now. They're going to sing. We're going to pray. I'm asking you all over the building, if you've served God five years, five months, or 50 years, you need to be down around this altar area because we're going to reaffirm a commitment to the Lord God Almighty. God, I'm here. I'm here to stay. I'm not going anywhere. I know I'm a mess, but you still love me. That's it, would you come? Come on around the front. Make room. Lift up your hands and let's pray together right now. God, in your name. God, I want to thank you that I've been called. I want to thank you that I've been chosen. I want to thank you that I got picked for the team. I want to thank you, Lord, that I've been brought out of darkness and into the light. That's it. Come on, let's talk to the Lord. I want to thank you for picking me. I want to thank you for choosing me. What a privilege. What an opportunity. What a gift.